Hey, power people. Welcome to Renewable Rides, powered by Vector. I'm Gareth Evans, the CEO and founder. And I'm Dan Roberts, head of sales. In each episode, we'll uncover the latest trends, learnings, challenges, and triumphs relating to the energy transition, on-site energy, and sustainability through the experiences of our inspiring guests and team here at Vector. So get ready for an exhilarating adventure into the fast-paced world of challenging limits, adapting purposely, and empowering co-creation to accelerate the energy transition with those that are on a mission to create a more resilient, profitable, sustainable, and thriving energy future. So let's go. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Renewable Rides. And uh, we are honored to be wel- to be joined today by Will Wells, who is an uh, exited AI founder and turned climate tech uh, investor. And Will, we, uh, we had the pleasure of meeting you when we were going through our last fundraise. You had some incredible insights, advice, and guidance, and uh, excited to jump into some of that today with you. Great to be with you guys. So, Will, we always start with uh, what are you passionate about? Like, how did you end up here? What what really motivates you? It's a good question. I think I'm I'm most passionate about breakthrough science, the science that works, um, big ideas, big checkbooks, and big brains. <laughs> Absolutely love that. And where where does that come from? Where did it? Where did that kind of interest and passion stem from? Was it from your upbringing, or like where does that? Gosh, I think I was. Um, I was mostly dis. Well, I was always a, always a bit of a dreamer growing up, and when I was working in finance, I was helping to run a hedge fund, and probably a bit disillusioned by the the pure finance piece, even though it was super exciting and you're a wannabe master of the universe. Um, and then I was, I was very ill. I had cancer for two years and I guess it got me think it got, you know, suddenly science was the one that was, you know, predestined my future and got me thinking about breakthrough health, healthcare. And I'd grown up wanting to start a climate business and, you know, there that became Hummingbird, which was my own startup. So I think it was a sort of funny, organic, existential evolution. Wow. How old were you when you had cancer? So I was 29. Um, I remember so I spent, I think I spent my 30th birthday in hospital, uh, which is just over 10 years ago now. So it wasn't, it was not a fun or happy moment in my life, but you know, something that I think um almost every single family has now. It's kind of it's crazy. But um yeah, I'm very lucky to be alive. So like ha- happy days ahead, hopefully. Yeah. Can you share some insights into like how how did it come on? What were what were the sensations, or like how did you know that you had it? And yeah, how did you mentally get through it? It's funny because you have a sort of um, I never know whether you historically look back and sort of almost change the narrative, but I didn't feel right. You know, it was like something in my something in my absolute core was sort of off off kilter, and. But at the time, like this happens a lot with young people in particular, like, you know, it creeps up on you and the fitter you are, the faster it grows. So you're kind of not sleeping and you have night sweats and you lose a bit of weight, but like that could just be stress. Right. So Mm -hmm. I had no signs and there was nothing in my family. There was nothing in, you know, I didn't even have a doctor. I was never sick. Um, And anyway, I was diagnosed with an extremely rare and aggressive form of throat cancer and I think I'm like one of the longest surviving people in Europe with it now, but I should be completely fine, but it was very aggressive and I had to have lots and lots of surgery and adjunctive radiochemical treatment. And, um, and then it was like a bit of a, they sort of discharged me having spent two years being pumped full of morphine and in and out of hospital. And they were sort of like, well, if it comes back, you're a goner. And if it doesn't, you're going to live forever or live until you, something else gets you. Wow. So I had this sort of totally existential um, sort of end of treatment uh, situation. So I just thought, you know what, I, I, I never want to, you know, I want to work for myself and give it a go. And 
I said everything about, I then went to go and do my MBA and started working on an idea at, at INSEAD in, just outside of Paris. And, um, and the rest is history. And that, I really appreciate you sharing, especially the, um, some of those details there. Well, can you share a little bit about how that shifted your, your mindset personally, professionally? You mentioned you went, went and got your MBA, you started Hummingbird. Like, how did that shift how you perceive life and, and what you want to get out of life? It's a good question. So it's funny because like getting something like cancer in a, in a really cynical way kind of makes it easy to have no fear because suddenly like nothing else really matters. And like, maybe we all need a bit of that, that kick to get out, to get over the edge. Like you, when you meet founders, you kind of think, well, like you're, you're born a founder and you're born fearless. But like, for me, it, I, I actually probably was a bit afraid of doing stuff like that. And suddenly I didn't care. And just decided, like, i got to swing the bat. You know, if if it comes back, I just don't want to look back and regret anything. And I have an idea and I want to build something big out of it and hire a team and raise money and change the world in, in a sort of in technology terms. And I think, and then privately, like, you know, I was very lucky. Like, I, I had friends and family that supported me and, you know, like, Normally in your 70s, you have a sort of existential, what does it all mean? But I had it all in my 20s and it's mm -hmm. actually a real gift. So touch wood, I'm, I came through it unscathed or, or relatively unscathed. And um, yeah, now I have like a, at least some different lens on life, I think. And so then did that inspire Hummingbird or did you already have that idea before or how did that come about? One, I remember one of my data scientists said that when we were sort of product canvassing kind of what does the Hummingbird 1.0 look like, we were using high resolution imagery from drones and robots to try and detect disease in crops. The idea was if you can see the disease in a field, you'll use less chemicals because, you know, you'd, otherwise it's just chemotherapy. So it was like weirdly it was a cancer metaphor. It was a... Mm. You know, and it's, I guess the MRI scan and the data analytics, it was all sort of, sort of in a sort of very sinister way. It was sort of metaphorical. I think in that way, it inspired it. Um, but I think like whether you're someone that has been sick or whether you're someone that's passionate about climate or passionate about science, like the thing that unites us all is that sort of big breakthrough impact and that's always been the thing that excites me, you know, illness or not. Like it's just, you know, so I kind of went for a very big problem, you know, in the center of, you know, the eye of the storm and, and went for that, which is it's not always the best idea <laughs> in building software. But can, can you take us back to kind of, and take us on the journey. So the, the, the Genesis you work with, working with data scientists, product canvassing, but then, how did you then start to engage the market, raising capital? Take us through that journey. Well, we we knew that we were onto a big problem because for all no farmer likes spending money on chemicals. And aside from like environmental, you know, destruction, it's like just bad PL management. And we did some initial customer scoping and then we and we went full on into the science and to be honest, probably made a, almost a bit of a mistake sort of focusing too much on the science and not almost not enough on the problem, I think. Nevertheless, we we built a product that was, I guess, a first of its kind. So like no one had really used remote sensing, AI, bioinformatics, agronomy, image processing. These are like reasonably complex layers of any stack, even in 2023, let alone 2015 2016 and we put it all together and lo and behold we had a product that ultimately we couldn't sell because operationally it's very difficult to get onto a farm with stuff like drone enabled imagery so you know fast forwarding a few years and 25 million dollars raised and a team of 65 and and so forth we we ended up being, I think, either the first or one of the first people in the world to measure soil health indirectly from space, which kind of became this MRV piece of Regen Ag, a very important layer. 
Um, but you know, it took us a while to get there, and like we were early. I just don't know whether that's always a good thing either. Yeah. And so, did you find it um, natural for you to raise money, having come from the finance background, or how was that process like? Because twenty five mil isn't a number to be um, kind of shaken at. Like that's that's some big fundraising efforts. How did you go about doing that? 25 is like probably a hundred. Sometimes think it's maybe a hundred today, but it, the raising money is not always hard. Raising money from the right people is hard. Mm. And I guess like raising money at the right time and then spending it wisely is even harder. So like there was probably a bit of naivety in the, in the last dimensions. Like naturally I was like not, not bad at raising money. I like found it like not reasonably easy, but kind of it came more naturally to me than let's say thinking about like product roadmaps and how to manage like engineers in sprints like that for me, it was more alien. Um, uh, I think like if you're a founder, you've got it. I mean, that's the, you know, there are skill sets you can get away with not having. And then there's skill sets you absolutely need. And I think either you or another co-founder, you've got to be able to raise money. Like mm. that you're, that's the lifeblood. Yeah. And so what was the exit process? What, why did you decide to exit and how did that feel? Was it, was it your baby that you were sad to see go or were you stoked to kind of be moving on to new and new and different things? I mean, the, be under no illusion that there was, it was a pretty, it was a defensive soft landing in many mm. ways. Um, won't, won't say more, but the, like, you know, it went to a good home. It went to, you know, a key customer. I'm pretty involved still at a board advisory sort of CEO relationship level. Like the business is thriving. The science lives on. I st stay in touch with most of the team. Um, it's kind of, I don't know, like in, in some ways, particularly if you have a lot of challenges, like any ending is or any ending is is a sort of it's an ending right and some of that's cathartic some of that's painful some of that's happy it's it's a complex mix of emotions i think i think like scientifically there's lots to be proud of and given that my career is you know in climate and deep tech and you know i've done a massive amount of stuff since i exited and it's all part of that same narrative. And, you know, I look back on really dumb hires that I made or like awful product decisions I made or the things that I did wrong as a CEO or, and then things that we did right. And it's sort of, you know, it just helps you, you know, like the, the, the thing is like, if I was some kind of swashbuckling decacorn founder that's like never made a mistake like i don't think founders are going to like talking to me very much yeah. whereas i can look them in the eye and say like trust me i've like screwed this up more and i think hopefully that counts for something in the authentic world that should be startups yeah so we'll fast forward to today you're a partner in in two different firms how do you see your like i've always believed that operators founders that have then moved into vcs have a have a have a much stronger case and can 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 compete for the the best deals how, how do you see that playing out in your in your world today I, I think you're right i mean um i mean just to just to clarify both places that i work at so first minute and norskin have like really strong founder dna so brent hobeman two-time unicorn founder Niklas at Norskin, the, the, the Klarna co-founder. I mean, these are some of Europe's absolutely top founders. So, and there's loads of people on the team that like have done their operational time and with lots of success and lots of failures as well. So like it is everywhere. You look at some VCs and you just think, God, you guys just don't get it. And like, I, I wish I'd known some of that, I think, back in the day. Um, I think both funds are extremely empathetic to founders they would always back founders like it's actually interesting i I read the um hummingbird not my hummingbird but hummingbird ventures story the other days and like every startup goes through two or three 
to the existential crises in their life cycle. And actually their, their philosophy is to, to double down or triple down. And, and, and I think if you back the founders and you back the teams and you really get behind businesses and you're in the trenches with them, I think your returns are better. And well, founders are definitely, the good founders are definitely going to choose you as an investor and your, your returns are hopefully better as well. So I think culturally, I, I was lucky to join places that, you know, have, have amazing people and have that philosophy. Otherwise, otherwise it's a waste of time, I think. Yeah. And you're now hyper-focused on clean tech. What are you, uh, what are you seeing in the market that's getting you super excited, Will, um, from a clean tech and energy transition perspective? I mean, I mean, the last two years have been pretty busy. I've done, I've done everything from green cement to, you know, energy grid and machine learning software plays to hydrogen and submarine storage and, um, everything in between. And like, it is just, it's like fizzing with excitement. And because my pedigree is more AI that, you know, I'm, I'm in like right in the hot seat at the moment. Yeah. So it's fun and lots of things are exciting me. I think I, with, I'm very, I've always been like a evangelical about computational platforms for alternative materials. And, and like, I love the computational biology potential of, of some of what we're seeing. I still think there are some just like massive companies to be made sort of you know, bio, biology to disrupt synthetic fertilizer. And mm. what if we can create kind of alternative you know, alternative types of metals so that we don't have to mine critical minerals in, in the Congo or buy them from China. Like there's some pretty big macro things moving. And um, you know, thanks to thanks to your um inflation reduction act and lots and lots of European sort of tax dollars, like it's a there are some pretty big tailwinds as well. Um not least to mention, you know, every fund under the sun saddling up on climate and you know i mean there's some big mistakes to be made there as well right because some bad things are get fu getting funded or or getting funded too much but um the winds are moving in the right direction well you i think you've got an interesting seat if you will um you're based in london but you've you've got visibility in in your fingers in both the us and europe what are some of the differences you're seeing across those two markets and, and maybe some of the similarities as well? Yeah. Well, I would have, like, if Mistral hadn't happened in the last week, I probably would have said something about Europe lacking big company ambition. But, we, like, never, you know, the, the thing about Europe is whether you lift the rock under the Stockholm, you know, North Vault type ecosystem or go to Berlin and you talk to all the startups that are following NPAL and early winners there. Like there's just a lot of super bright teams attacking the space. There's some really decent, like existing IP. So like, obviously you don't want too much cap table presence from universities, but there's some great university spin outs in Europe. I think like culturally, it's just a, it's just a good place for for teams to be starting a climate business. So if you look at the numbers, you still it's still Stockholm one, London three, Berlin five. I mean, these are these are big positions versus normal tech. Um so, you know, i there are 25,000 climate companies in Europe. I probably know well, I'd say half of all the decent founders or teams in that, in that, you know, of the of the winners and like it's a pretty it's just it's it's a fun place to be investing and there's stuff going on everywhere to be honest and on the u.s side how do you think that compares u.s is like u.s can like has fascinated me my whole career most of most of my business has always been in the u.s and a lot of my network is there and just the leap the leapfrog in ambition that I've seen in the last two years is like deeply encouraging. And 
I think it's that it's that sort of build a really big business mindset that I think sometimes European founders lag or, or or dare I say they like sell they sell once they're in that zone that, that excites me and on a kind of we did a really cool company in New York that does fintech for electric vehicle transitions we did an alter we did a seawater to magnesium business in California and we've looked at the grid and in Texas and we did verse which is how do we how do data centers access renewable energy and there's some very very cool stuff going on um and like it's excitingly it's coming from everywhere let me look at look at what vector's doing you know you guys have a front row seat onto corporate america decarbonizing so you kind of i mean like i should ask you the question (laughs) yeah i think uh certainly Expecting 2024 to be quite a breakout year, candidly. Well, I think it's been bubbling under the surface for years and there's been a lot of talk and a lot of hype, especially for the on-site energy market and microgrids and the energy transition in general. And I think, like you say, the tailwinds are there now in terms of one, the government funding and tax incentives and depreciation. So financially, these systems are being sponsored. The tech is in a really good space where it's actually... Yeah, you know, they're technically very viable and very competitive, and the pain points are mounting. Like energy costs are very unpredictable, and so even if businesses approach it just from a business hedging perspective, it's a very important uh, step for them to be taking. But there's a lot of very positive benefits they can get from reducing their costs, increasing sure. their resilience, reducing their emissions. Like it becomes a win-win-win when businesses do it right, and I think it's that combination of hard tech digitalization, financial market support, they're all starting to merge to make the kind of perfect um, ingredients for success. Well, having having been like eternally optimistic for the whole call, I guess I, do, I agree with you. Although sometimes if I wake up on the wrong side of bed, it's yep. like not hitting net zero targets. A, yep. B, like no one's factored in a, Two hundred billion dollar like climate disaster in Miami when it floods and like could there be some like could climate itself actually be some sort of great financial crisis type event down the tracks? And then on the investing side, we still have like a major bottleneck in funding hardware. The deep technology stack is broken. No one, no one wants to finance first of a kind, you mm. know, green spent facilities or cellular protein biomanufacturers like there's no insurance product for trl risk there's no there's no financial instrument that works like vcs don't get it most most of them don't um infrastructure doesn't want to invest in it family offices don't want to touch it so like we're dancing around the edges with some quite sexy early software wins like arcadia or goodly or empal or plan a or watershed but like we need to get you know nuclear and hydrogen and biology and chemistry funded as well which is hard what do you think are some of the some of the potential solves for 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 that and getting the capital where it needs to be and and solving some of these challenges so some of it like is um some of it's candidly the founder needs to figure out so gone are the days that you can like rock up at a vc's boardroom and say i need 50 million dollars to build my manufacturing site and it's all going to be paid in equity and i'm going to come back for another 50 when i'm spent it i think like that's got to be dialed down and the way that you can apart from like the ask needs to be smaller and needs to be more bootstrapped and sequenced correctly. And if I was a food company in deep climate tech and food, so basically I'm a deep tech company selling to big food. It's like, how do I persuade PepsiCo and Nestle and Cargill to give me offtakes? And, you know, if I'm a direct air capture plant, let's get, a deal with frontier and maybe like exxon's going to give me some of their 
oil and gas capacity. I mean, you've got to think pretty creatively about commercial support, minimizing the ask. How do we get grant funding alongside? How do we insure away some of these risks? How do we think about milestones really cleverly? And then let's like go to an investor with a really nice, like a really nice combination of an ask having hit some of those wins. I think like a big idea and a deck and a big ask is just gonna, it's just gonna get a pass. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts, Will, around, you know, we're seeing some governments and corporates now stepping back from the commitments they've made. Um, like what, what do you think is driving that? Do you think um, policy was ahead of science? Do you think too ambitious? Do you think now nerves creeping in because they realize they haven't got a plan to execute? Uh, what's, your kinda, what's your observation on why why we're seeing these trends? Like maybe all of the above, but I just, I don't know US, I don't want to, you know, try and be a US political expert, which, which I'm not. Um, but in Europe, there's, you know, we're all, we've seen a polarization of everything in the last few years, but quite a dangerous kind of narrative that creeps in recently is, is this sort of anti-green to win votes. And it seems to be quite localized and polarized, but like there is a legitimate danger that green bashing or policy unwinds become politically popular, particularly mm. cost of living crisis and very, very challenging context for lots of people and i think that is just short that would be major shame and short-sighted and just yeah there's been a lot of progress that that would be unwound so i think and i can't yeah there's there's it's all to play for but that's that's a worry we had an interesting conversation last week on an episode that's yet to air with uh with tony french and we, we talked a bit about this concept of following the money. And I think in in climate, uh, there's so much tailwinds as we talked about before. We've seen this the the conversation shift from just purely sustainability to this is all pragmatic economics. Um, and I'm just curious how how you see that fitting into this conversation to actually quell those issues. Well, I'm a big believer in the Bill Gates mantra, the breakthrough mantra, which is no one will buy anything if it's just a climate version of an existing product. It has to be like a better product and a ubiquitously brilliant. And the user's problems are solved better, whether that's an electric vehicle battery or it's, you know, sustainable aviation fuel or, you know, a trainer that's been made with sneaker. It's been made from circular materials. So like it needs to be better. So companies climate companies need to provide solutions that are better than existing ones and preferably cheaper as well. So I think kind of, I have quite a brutalistic capital markets type opinion of that. And I, I don't like it as an investor when you know, there's subsidized market demand beyond a certain point, or it's just a soft yes. I like, mm. you know, I like, you know, electric vehicles are better because they're faster or they are quiet or they last longer or they look cooler. I don't, whatever it is, just like find a, find me a, re a, a reason beyond being green. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're feeling the same in the market when we're working with large corporates because as much as they say they want to do the right thing, everybody needs to have a, a financial business case to actually get something done. Exactly. And so what are you looking for, Will, like for people listening into this? And obviously uh, you're investing in this industry regularly. Are there a, is there a particular segment, particular stage, particular style of company that you're, you're looking for that you want people to reach out? Yeah. So, okay. So if you're a US, like super early stage company so pre-seed or seed thinking about europe and like would it be a good idea to have a you know europe leading european investor on your cap table that's the funds not me um then then would love to hear from you i 
I lo- like anyone that's building, you know, computational bio or computational materials or or doing something cool involving a first principles basic problem with the grid. Like I would love to hear from you. Um and you know, never never early is like never you can never be too early, right? So an idea and a co-founder is good enough. That's awesome. And in terms of uh your own aspirations, is it VC world for good? Are you a through and through investor or could you be tempted back to the the founder side? Well, I think probably I mean like, I feel like a bit of a coward, like not being fully risk on as a founder, but I'm pretty happy doing what I'm doing and I'm learning an absolute ton all the time. And it's, it's, um, I pr- I've quite a cool job. I spend all day with really smart science teams pitching to me how to solve, you know, world problems. And I mean, I, I it's, I'm not going to give that up in a hurry. So, um, so far so good. And, but like watch this space, I think. Nice. And yeah, uh, I've seen you do a really good job of this. You know, you first minute you've got multiple interns in in house, and you're kind of training the next gen. In terms of people looking to get into the VC world, um, what advice would you have? Have an angle and create some currency because I get a gazillion requests for you know general catch ups and advice around how do I break into climate or how do I break into VC, but. You know, if someone sent me an email saying, like, I'd love to have a chat. I've spent, you know, a few weeks looking at mycelium materials for this industry. And I really like these two startups. Like, I'm going to pick up the phone. And, but, but I, su- I suppose it's like, you know, the big, the crowd wants to get into climate and the crowd wants to get into VC, but just, just differentiate yourselves, but not from, school you went to or anything on your cv but just the ideas that you have and just the sort of the energy and the the passion and the insights because yeah and that's the same if you talk to founders or if you talk to people in big industry or talk to vcs create your own currency like and currency is ideas and fresh ideas that are original and you know off you go so good yeah i love that well uh you see a lot of different technologies, especially bleeding edge technologies, long before anybody in the broader market sees them. So I'm eh, curious how you'll answer this. But we ask all of our guests, if you could be in any energy technology, what would it be and why? Well, I had a suspicion you're going to ask me this. And I was going to say something very clever about being a solar panel because the sun's always shining. But that sounds horribly <laughs> <laughs> horribly cheesy and I'm not going to do it. So I'm going to say I'm going to be a wind turbine blade instead just because they're big and and they look cool. And um, yeah, I like, I just, I like the look of them. Nice. Yeah. It's a good one. And in terms of, uh, is there a favorite quote or anything that motivates you on a daily basis? Steve Crossan on my team, who is, who is head of the AlphaFold project at DeepMind, him and I share a quote, which is swing the bat. You just got to do it. Love it. Take your yeah. chances. Simple yet uh, powerful. I love that. And uh, last one, if you could uh, listen to anyone on our podcast, who would it be and what would you ask them? I would... I would love to reincarnate Elvis and listen to him on your podcast <laughs> and ask him all the questions that we've always wanted to ask Elvis, but also about what he thinks about climate. And, you know, I'm sure he's got some good ideas. Well, maybe we can get the actor on instead of Elvis himself. Yeah, exactly. Or I'm sure we can, uh, Will might be able to point us in the direction of some AI that, uh, that can <laughs> <laughs> recreate well, Elvis. You know like, this is a very desert island, di- desert island discs kind of type conundrum. But like maybe I, I'd, maybe I'd reincarnate like a whole series of Einsteins and Thomas Edison's and Marie Curies and just get them on a deep tech 
first of a kind climate round table for an afternoon and see what they come up with. That's hilarious. Really like we might that. have to think about that. <laughs> Will you, would, would you help be the moderator of that? Do you know what? For the first time in my life, I think I would keep my mouth firmly shut and just listen to what this. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Is there anything, uh, any closing thoughts, ideas, asks of, uh, of the listeners of Renewable Rides, Will? No, just pleasure to be on, guys. And thanks for all the, all the questions and for having me. That's been awesome. Um, where can people find you, Will, uh, to close it out? Will Wells, LinkedIn, and I'm pretty good at replying. Yeah. Now you've been awesome. Uh, we appreciate everything you've done in terms of your coaching, support, advice, guidance. Um, that experience goes a huge way and I uh, love the way you see the world. Uh, thank you for all you do. Uh, keep up the awesome work. Cheers. Cheers, Gareth. Cheers, Dan. Thanks a lot, guys. Cheers, Will. Appreciate you, Will. Dan, what an awesome interview. Yeah, it was a pleasure. I, I'm, uh, one, I've, I really enjoyed the interactions with Will over the, over the past couple of years and, and his guidance. And as I, as I stated, I think from, from my perspective on the, uh, kind of founding team and building a company side of things, there's, there's no better investors than the ones that have been through the trenches and had the challenges of, of building a company from scratch. So I, I, I very much value his uh, his perspective. Yeah, I thought it was great. I think we covered a lot of ground, and I think it was awesome to get a different perspective on the industry from that kind of VC angle, especially from someone who's been through it as a founder. Uh, I think one comment that really stood out for me was your ideas are your currency. And I think it's for anyone, whether they're raising money, building a business, hiring teams, people, um, I think that's so important, isn't it? Is how do you use that vision and your storytelling and your passion, purpose, ideas to um, enroll people to get on board and go on that journey before you can actually show them any hard metrics, hard cash, hard opportunities. And I think that was a, an awesome, awesome saying from Will. And I, I stand by that and I would be very supportive of, of that comment and encourage everyone to use that um, every day. What, yeah. what about you? Yeah, for me, it, it was Will's comment. And I think it's it's uh, it's very clear now where this sentiment came from for him, um, given his his battle with cancer, but just swing the bat. He didn't want to he didn't want to regret anything if his cancer relapsed. And, and I think for all of us, it's a good reminder to just if we have something that is we're itching at or something that we want to do, could just get out there and do it. It, it, it reminds me of, of my favorite quote, which is a Teddy Roosevelt quote about the man in the arena and, and just um, not being afraid to get out there, fail, put yourself out there. I think it's critically important. We need more people, you know, entering the energy transition and it can be a daunting task to, to, to move from one industry to another, but just get out there, do it, swing the bat, whether it's starting a company or joining a growing company or or creating change within your broader organization. Just just go out there and, and make it happen. So yeah. that's, that's what really stuck out for me. Yeah, that was amazing. And I think that really then led into, you know, be creative and lean in your approach. You know, don't just go out asking for a bunch of money and expecting people to rock up and jump on the bandwagon, you know, be lean, be assertive, figure out unique business models and avenues to get uh, access to cash or insights or data or whatever you need to get to that next next milestone. So it was a thoroughly enjoyable conversation and excited to uh, see where he goes and who he invests in because uh, I think whoever he invests in, we should pay close attention to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, appreciate it. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the next one. That was fun. See you next time. See you guys. We receive a lot of questions from business leaders around the world wanting to learn more about the energy transition, what is possible and where to start. So to help you stay informed and up to date on best practices, opportunities, risks and success stories, we created an industry news feed at vector.com forward slash news with all our podcasts, blogs and newsletter. Check it out and connect with Dan, myself and the Vector team to learn more. Cheers and have a good one.